Open your Bibles now to Colossians chapter 2, please. We're continuing in our series, Journey to Spiritual Maturity. And the journey means that it's something that continues, that you go on, that you don't, uh, you don't necessarily finish, but you do uh, intentionally make the trip. And so we are in this journey, and today we are looking at Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Jesus is all I need. Jesus is all I need. And in verse 9, Paul told the people at Colossae, In him, Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you're complete in him. We'll talk about that some more in a little bit. Now, what we have happening today is this. There are a lot of false gurus and messiahs in the world today. Lots of that. And the Bible predicts and warns about that. I gave a slide with just one, kind of one representation of, of many. You see, the Bible says in Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets in Christ will arise and deceive many. Now, listen to the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 24. You may want to kind of put a marker in Colossians 2 and go to Matthew 24 because notice what it says Jesus is speaking now in Matthew 24 23 and 25 I don't have a slide for this you're going to have to look it up that's what we can't be totally lazy here all right that's on purpose we want you to bring your Bibles the the reason I have you say why do you put the verses on the slides because it's for people who come as visitors and guests and don't have a Bible that's why okay um and, you know, you can look on your phone if you want to, on the scripture there. Uh, the the, the version Bible is a great Bible to use. I use that uh, on my phone and on my iPad. But uh, notice what Matthew 24 says. Verse 23, Jesus is speaking. He went on after he warned them in verse 11 that there would be many false prophets in Christ that would arise. By the way, the word Christ means Messiah. Okay? That's why he said many false prophets and Christ will arise. The word Christos is Messiah, the anointed one. That's what that means. All right. Now, look at verse 23 and 25. If any man shall say unto you, Jesus is speaking, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Now watch. Insomuch that if it were possible... They shall deceive the very elect. And by that he means believers. Okay? So Jesus gives a good warning here. He says, watch out. Because in the last days, there are going to be a lot of, not just one or two, a lot of false Christ and false messiahs. And they will even be able to show great signs and wonders. So that lets you know that just doing a sign or a wonder is no proof that somebody is a servant of God, okay? And if you want a classic illustration of that in the Bible, when Moses went into Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, well, how do I know God sent you? Moses said, well, look at this. And he flip, puts his rod down on the ground, and it turns into a snake. You know what Pharaoh said? He said, big deal. Big deal. Hey, come here, guys. And he called two of his magicians up, Janice and Jambres. He said, show them your stuff. Boom. They put their rods down, and their rods turned into snakes also. So you need to, you need to recognize that just because somebody can do miracles or signs is no proof of anything. Okay. Now, that's Matthew 24, 23, and 25. In 1 John 2, 18, listen to what the Apostle John said. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. It also says in Matthew 7, 15, and you guys want to write these references down. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Luke 28, Jesus said, watch out that you are not deceived. Do not follow them. Now, 
never has there been so many men claiming to be the Messiah. In fact, last night, just for the fun of it, I, I put that in the search bar on the computer, you know? False. How many false Christs, how many false Messiahs have there been? Hit enter. Bam. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of web pages that I could have read if I wanted to take the time that would tell me the names of dozens and dozens and dozens, probably in the hundreds, of people who had claimed to be Christ, the Messiah. And that fact alone is a fulfillment of ancient prophecy that Jesus spoke. And it's more solid proof of the Bible's accuracy and reliability and credibility as the Word of God and an indication that we're now surely living in the end times. Some years back it was Jim Jones. Remember him? Jonestown? He got all those people to drink the Kool-Aid and they mass suicide. David Koresh of Waco, right here in Texas. Then you had the Australian Jesus, a.k.a. A.J. Miller and his wife Mary. You had the Siberian Christ, Sergei Torop, an ex-policeman who believes he's a literal reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Down in Miami, Florida, you have a pastor called Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. He can't make up his mind if he's Jesus or the Antichrist, as he claims to be both. Now, these are just some of the many false prophets and messiahs that pop up all over the world right now, in this century. Not only are we seeing the rise of false messiahs around the world, but there's also a massive deception occurring in the church of Jesus Christ. There's a falling away, as the Bible puts it, into doctrines of demons, teaching that appeals to itching ears, but it's contrary to God's word. In fact, 2 Timothy 4.1 gives you this warning. Now watch. 2 Timothy 4.1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us plainly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. 2 Timothy 4.3. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires... They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So there's the warnings from the Bible. See? God plainly tells us that there's going to be lots and lots and lots of people who say, oh, you don't, you don't need Jesus. I've got something better. I'm someone better. And so with that as a backdrop, Notice now four things that Paul the Apostle tells us about Jesus Christ in Colossians chapter 2 here. Why did Jesus come? Well, God wants us to know that Jesus is all that I need. God wants you and me to know that Jesus is all we need. First of all, number one, Jesus is all we need to know about God. Jesus is all we need to know about God. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. In him, in Christ, the fullness of God lives in a human body. Now, the fullness word means sum total. Jesus Christ was the totality of everything God can be, watch, in flesh and blood. And be sure you get that last part of the definition, okay? Jesus Christ was the totality of everything God can be in flesh and blood. John 1, 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. He was with God and He was God. Verse 14, John 1, 14. So the Word became flesh, became human, and lived here on earth among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father. Now, all that God wants us to know about himself is revealed in Jesus Christ. Everything God could show us through flesh and blood was revealed in Jesus. Jesus, then, is every bit God. Now, watch this. But this does not mean that the infinite God was contained in bodily form. You say, you're, you contradict yourself. No, no. Just keep listening. 
Jesus is every bit God, but that doesn't mean that the infinite God was contained totally right there in bodily form. It's like the metaphor of the ocean, all right? Let me, sh let me sh give you that, all right? Now just imagine yourself standing in front of a vast, seemingly endless ocean, all right? Some of you have had the privilege to go to the ocean on vacations, and some of you have been there, if not this summer, other times. All right, now, let's take a pint jar, okay? Fill a pint jar with the water from that ocean, all right? You now have all of the ocean that can be put into that jar, right? Even though the ocean itself is seemingly infinite, do you understand? And that's the way it was with the body of Jesus Christ and God. See, in the same way, even though God can never be fully contained in a human body, everything God could be in human flesh, he was in Jesus Christ. All that your and my finite minds can understand about God is revealed in Jesus Christ. In other words, like the little kids like to say, Jesus is God with skin on his face. Jesus is God with skin on. He is spelling himself out in a language we can understand. Now Hebrews 1 talks some more about why God sent Jesus. Hebrews 1, 1, 2, and 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets many times and in many different ways. But now, in these final days... He has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son he made the universe and everything in it. The Son, that's Jesus, reflects God's own glory, and everything about him represents God exactly. He sustains the universe by the mighty power of his command. After he died to cleanse us from the stain of sin, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God of heaven. So Jesus Christ is everything that we need to know about God. Number two, Jesus is all we need, not only to know about God, but all we need for salvation. Now what's the word salvation means? It means deliverance. Deliverance from what? Deliverance from the penalty and the power of sin. What's the penalty of sin? The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. Colossians 2.10. Watch what it says. You are complete with Christ through your union with Christ, who is the Lord over every ruler and authority in the universe. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and let me clarify what that means. We're not talking about taking communion. Some churches teach that when people, you know, go to church and put the wafer in their mouth, they're, quote, receiving Christ. That's not what the Bible means by that. When it says you accept Christ, receive Christ, it doesn't mean take communion. Now, I'm not against taking communion, but that's not receiving Christ, all right? Because to receive Christ as your Savior, you only have to do that once, one time. People take communion many times, don't they? So... What's it mean to receive Christ? Well, John 1.12 says, As many as receive him, to those he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who watch, believe on his name. See? Two key words in John 1.12, receive and believe. You see, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will receive him as your personal Savior. You will accept him into your life. And by the way, He's not rude. He doesn't come into your life if you don't want him there. That's why Revelation 3 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door. How do you open the door? You open the door by inviting him in, just like you at your house. If somebody's standing outside the door, if you open the door, they're standing there. If, unless they're a really, really good friend, they're not going to just barge right in. If they're standing there and you want them in, what do you say? You say, please come in, right? And that's what the Bible means when it says in Romans 10, 13, whoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever shall say to the Lord, please come into my life. I want to turn control of my life over to you. 
Now when we accept Jesus Christ in that way as our personal Savior, we're made complete. Now that word complete is a very interesting word in the Greek language. It means outfitted. You know, like when you outfit a ship for a voyage. Somebody's going to go on a voyage around the world. What do they do with their boat, their ship? Well, they get it seaworthy, but then they also outfit it. They, they get everything that they need for the journey, right? Now, here's what this means. Watch. When it says we're complete in him, it does not mean we're everything yet God wants us to be. All right? So I haven't arrived. You haven't arrived. But you better be on the journey. Right? So we're not everything God wants us to be. We're not everything he'll make us to be. But we have been given everything in Christ that we need for the voyage of life. Now, what's the end of that verse mean where it says he's the head of all principality and powers or rulers and authority? Well, that's a very interesting uh, phrase. That means that Jesus has authority over all the evil forces that exist in the universe. All the evil forces. You say, are there evil forces in the universe? Absolutely. There's an evil being called Satan. He's real. He also has evil angels that follow him. In the Bible, they're called demons or evil spirits. Now, there's a very interesting story in Acts 19 where these Jewish uh, exorcists, they were trying to use the name of Jesus because they were jealous of the apostles of the Lord. And so they came upon this demon-possessed man and they, in the name of Jesus, tried to get that spirit to leave, okay? Uh, they're called the seven sons of Sceva, all right? Acts 19. And when they did that, when they tried to use the name of Jesus, the Bible says that the demon or the evil spirit spoke back to them. And this is what the demon said. Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the guy jumped on all seven of them and whooped them. Good. I mean, beat the tar out of them. And they ran and fled. See? You say, what does that prove? Well, all that proves is that even the demons, the evil spirits, they know who Jesus is and they know who belongs to Jesus and who doesn't. And that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because they didn't just take off because these men used Jesus' name. They knew those men didn't have any relationship to Jesus Christ. Say, and if you don't have a relationship to Jesus Christ, you can't just use his name like some kind of magic wand to get what you want or to have power over demonic forces. Christ, though, does. And he has all authority and all power. And what that means, Christian, is that you don't have to be afraid of evil spirits. You don't have to be afraid of Satan. In fact, there's a great scripture, James 4, 7 says, Surrender yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So Satan, while he's more powerful than you and me, perhaps, he's not more powerful than you and I in the name of Jesus Christ, in the power of Christ. Do you understand? And Satan is not omnipotent or omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Now, there's a lot more we could say about that subject, but we need to continue. In the next verses, Paul talks about circumcision. What's that all about? It, verse 11, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So what's he talking about? All right, here's what he's talking about. Some of the Jews of that day, as they became Christians, they were telling the Gentile believers that they had to be circumcised to be a Christian. That's what these saved Jews were telling the non-Jews who wanted to come to Christ. Oh, well, that's good. Okay, you believe Jesus, but now you've got to be circumcised. And that wasn't true. It's kind of like people today who say you have to be baptized to be a Christian. All right? Now, you should be baptized, but baptism doesn't make you a Christian. Baptism is an identifying sign 
that you're a child of God through faith in Christ. Just like in the Old Testament, circumcision was an identifying sign in the Jewish males that they were God's chosen people. And that's the point that Paul's trying to make there. He says, and he talks about baptism in verse 12, when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, you were raised up with him through your faith in God's power, shown after he raised Christ from the dead. So physical baptism in the New Testament was like physical circumcision in the Old Testament. It identifies you as a child of God through faith in Christ. And Paul's saying it just like there are two kinds of baptism, physical and spiritual, there are two kinds of circumcision, physical and spiritual. Spiritual baptism is in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. By one spirit, you're all baptized into one body, the body of Christ. What's that mean? It means when you get saved, God immerses you into the body of Christ spiritually. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead saves us and changes us, Paul's saying here, watch. And we don't need to add circumcision, baptism, good deeds, or anything else to it. Jesus is all you need for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I mean that you have been saved by grace through believing. You did not save yourself. It was a gift from God. It was not the result of your own effort, so you can't brag about it. Jesus Christ is all you need for salvation. Remember what Peter said in Acts 4.12? He said, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you, what? Must be saved. And by the way, that's why today you need to understand this. The world hates the name of Jesus when it's used like this. They hate it. That's why they will tell sometimes preachers, oh, well, you, we want you to come and preach. See, they want to, you know, have, get that, that, that group's people in, involved. But you can't use Jesus' name. You, if you're going to pray at this public gathering, you can't pray in Jesus' name. They told Franklin Graham that, and he said, forget it, that I'm not coming. All right, and that's why he wrote the book then called The Name. That was one of the things that led to that. The world hates the name of Jesus. They hate, see, they, they, they say that they, they want religious tolerance for everybody. But if you say, okay, our religion teaches that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life, they say, well, we don't have any tolerance for you. But don't be surprised by that. Because that's what Jesus said was going to happen. He said, if the world hates you, don't be surprised. They hated me a long time before they ever hated you. In fact, they hated Jesus so much, what did they do to him? They nailed him to the cross. So you shouldn't be surprised if you stand up for Jesus that you're going to be hated. And by the way, this might be a clue as to why so many Christians don't want to stand up for Jesus. Because who wants to be hated? Who wants to be persecuted? So it can be okay to be religious, okay even to believe in God, but, you know, don't talk too much about Jesus because then you'll be a fanatic. What's wrong with that? People be Pittsburgh Steelers fanatics, right? Philadelphia Eagles fanatics, right? Baltimore Ravens fanatics. That's all a fan is, by the way. The word fan comes from fanatic. So how come people can be Fanatics for their favorite basketball teams, baseball teams, football teams, but then they can't be a fanatic for Jesus. They come to church and they say, oh, don't, don't shout, don't yell, don't say anything. Don't say amen. You get that preacher all worked up, you know, he might really go to town. If you ever get a chance to go to a black funeral, you should go to one. You say, what's that got to do with anything? You'll just see how people can be enthusiastic even at, in the face of death. Okay? And not be afraid to be fans for Jesus. I go to black funerals every chance I get. They, I get encouraged. Yeah. Jeff and Sherry Easter have a southern gospel song called It's Party Time. It's a cool song. You gotta listen to it. Look it up on YouTube. Party, don't do it now, look it up later. Okay. I gotta watch giving people that, you know. Some... 
Jesus is all we need for salvation. Number three, Jesus is all we need for forgiveness. Colossians 2.13, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature, which was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. Now, here's what we need to understand. Here's why mankind can't save himself. The Bible says that man is dead, spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. Once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins. You used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. By the way, that's the title for Satan in the Bible. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 2, 2. The mighty prince of the power of the air, he's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, Paul says, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature. We were under God's anger just like everyone else. So when you are spiritually dead, the Bible doesn't interest you. Spiritual things don't interest you. You know why? Because dead people can't respond to spiritual stimuli. That's why Paul said here that God makes us alive. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so very much, that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's special favor. That's what the word grace means in the Bible. It's by God's special favor that you have been saved. Now, when he saves you, what's he do with your sin? That's verse 14. It's an awesome verse. He canceled the record. He canceled the record. That contained the charges against us. He took it and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. Christ paid your sin debt. Now in Bible times, when you had a debt, you signed a paper that admitted you, owned the debt, you owed the debt. It would be kind of like a credit card slip, but it would be actually one where you signed the piece of papyrus, okay, the manuscript that said, you know, Mr. Dolan, Walter Meyer owes $50,000. And Dolan, you'd sign your name. Okay. Which basically said, yeah, I, I, that's right, I owe it. Okay. Now, that then piece of paper was the charge against you, what this verse is talking about, the record. Okay. And you didn't have a choice. If you owed the money, you signed it. They threw you in jail otherwise. Now, th that record, as long as that stood, you owed that money. And when you would pay the money off, if you could, then that record would be wiped clean. By the way, the paper in that day was so heavy that they could literally just take a damp rag and wipe it off. It wasn't like our paper today where it goes down into the paper and you couldn't do that. They literally could erase it with a, just a damp cloth. So They would wipe it clean. Now, if you couldn't pay then that record would stand against you. And after so long, the laws back in those days, if you couldn't pay, you were thrown in prison where you really wouldn't be able to pay. Now, that's what it's talking about here. It says that Jesus, he paid your sin debt. He, he wiped it clean and the debt was wiped out. There's a gospel song I remember the last line to where God says to you and me, what sins are you talking about? You get it? After you're saved. What sins are you talking about? God says, I don't have any record of your sin. Uh, you say, well, does that mean you're perfect? No, it means that he sees you perfect in Christ, and Christ wiped the record clean. He canceled the debt, canceled the record. He paid it. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. That's what that song means. Jesus is all we need for forgiveness. Number four, Jesus is all we need for victory. Verse 15, he disarmed the rulers of darkness and demonic forces, and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Jesus disarmed Satan, literally stripping him. He disarmed Satan. 
and the fallen angels, the rulers and the authorities, and he made a public display of them. What's that mean? Well, the idea here is like that of a triumphant Roman general. And when a Roman general would come back from battle, he would parade his defeated captives through the streets of Rome. He, they would be in chains and he would be dragging them, so to speak, behind his chariot as a proof. They would be put on display to the crowds there in Rome. And as they were in chains, it showed that that Roman general had been victorious. That's the language that is being used here by Paul. Christ's victory on the cross halted the demons in their attempts to stop his redemptive work and strip Satan of his powers. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, 57 is such a great verse. How we thank God who gives us victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory over sin and death. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 are great verses. You ought to have those marked in your Bible or underlined if you don't yet. So you ought to mark 57 as well, 1 Corinthians 15. That whole chapter, by the way, is the resurrection chapter. But Hebrews 2.14, listen to this. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, Jesus also became flesh and blood by being born in human form. For only as a human being could he die. Now watch. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he deliver those who have lived all their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Now let me help you understand something. Why I push so hard to get you to pass out tracts that can give people guaranteed reservations to heaven. This is, and this is why, okay? Every single human being on the planet is, is talked about in that last phrase on that verse. They are living their lives slaves to the fear of dying. Now, Occasionally, you'll meet some proud, egotistical person who says, well, I don't care if I'm going to die, you know. I don't care even if I go to hell. All my friends are in hell. But that person's, that person's foolish, and they're unusual. They're exceptional. There are not many people like that, right? Most people do not want to die. Do you know why? Because of this verse. Because they are slaves to the fear of dying because they don't know what's going to happen to them when they die. They don't know. Nobody's that in their experience told them about it that's been there and done it. Right? See, nobody ever died and came back and told you what it was like. But one person did. His name was Jesus. He died and then he came back to life so he could tell everybody, hey, guess what? You don't have to fear death because I beat it. And if you'll trust in me and believe in me, you can beat it too. And that's why Jesus Christ is all we need for victory. And that's why Paul said here, don't waste your time worshiping the demons. The cross of Jesus Christ is the answer to the false teacher's insistence on worshiping angelic beings. By the way, you, you say, well, nobody does that today, do they? Yeah, they do. I, I went to a website that was a, a, a listing, an index of blogs, okay? And you could look up the blogs by a category. And when I went to the spirituality category, there were dozens of categories under that. And guess what a big, huge one was? Angels and spirits. And when you click on that one, there are dozens and dozens of people who are writing about how they can help you with your own angel and your own spirit and your dog's angel and your dog's spirit if you want to know it. And they're making a lot of money doing it. Now, through the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, Ephesians 1, 20 to 23 and Ephesians 3, 10, God canceled the believer's debt, defeating Satan and his fallen angels. That is why Paul can affirm what he does in Romans 8, 37 to 39. Romans 8, 37 to 39. No, despite all these things... 
overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Despite all these, they say, what's the these things? Well, if you go to the verses before you find it, it's all the junk that happens to you in life. Okay? Despite all the trials and the problems and the difficulties of life, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced, verse 38. Let's read it together. Verse 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can and life can, the angels can't, and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. And then verse 39. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean. Read it with me. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in the creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now what you should do is you should get a hold of that truth and not forget it. Get a hold of it, not forget it. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't. Life can't. The angels can't. The demons can't. Our fears, here it is, our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow. That's the human race, folks. Fears for today, worries about tomorrow. That's why that song was written. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its heartache, for its skies may turn to gray. Many things about tomorrow I do not understand, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. Ephesians six twelve says that while we still wrestle against principalities and powers, the forces of evil, they can't be victorious. They can't be victorious. Christ, the crucified, risen Lord of all, reigns supreme in the universe. And when you're united with him, you're free from Satan's dominion. The death of Christ brings transformation, pardon, and victory. That adds up to complete salvation with complete forgiveness and triumph. No wonder Paul said, Galatians 6.14, our final verse. Galatians 6.14, as for me, God forbid, that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world died long ago. And the world's interest in me is also long dead. Read that with me before I close in prayer. As for me, God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world died long ago, and the world's interest in me is also long dead. I trust that's true in your life, and if it's not true, that you'll make it so today. Let's bow our heads and hearts and close with a word of prayer. If you've not trusted Jesus Christ yet for your salvation, I invite you to do that with me right now. You can bow your head quietly. And you can pray silently from your heart this prayer to God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the salvation that you've given me in Jesus Christ. Thank you that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the grave so I could conquer death like he did. I ask him now to come into my life and forgive my sins. Make me your child. Give me a home in heaven and a guaranteed reservation when I die. Help me now to live my life for you and not be ashamed of what I've done today. In Jesus' name I pray. And if you prayed that prayer in a minute, God saved you. If you're here in our audience, I'd like to thank God for saving you. Would you raise your hand right now and just by your raised hand, you're telling me, yeah, I prayed that prayer with you, Pastor Bill. I, I received 
Jesus Christ as my personal Savior in a personal way today. And I want to know that I have eternal life. I want you to know it, and I want you to thank the Lord. Now, it's very possible that there are people who prayed with me who are watching this video. And you may say, well, what do I do now? Well, if you'll write to us or email us, we'll be happy to send you some information that will help you to grow in your Christian life on your journey to spiritual maturity. And I wonder, Christian friend, if the Lord spoke to your heart today, if there's something perhaps that God's Holy Spirit's telling you to do as a believer. Maybe it's to let go of your fears and worries about tomorrow. Maybe it's to let go of your fears about death. Nobody wants to die, but when you die, you're absent from the body, present with the Lord in heaven. So I, Paul could pray and say, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. If you're a believer and you'd like to be remembered in prayer today and say, Pastor Bill, pray for me that I'll be obedient to do what God's telling me to do as a Christian. Would you lift your hand with me right now all over the audience? Yes, God bless you and you and you and you and you. Maybe you just need to get some more boldness about telling people about Jesus. You say, pray for me that I'll not be afraid, ashamed to use the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you now for your power and your promises. We thank you that Jesus Christ is all we need. Help us to not be ashamed of him. Help us to be like the Apostle Paul who said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And help us to be willing to tell people, to give out gospel tracts and do whatever we can to let people know that Jesus Christ died for them too. Help these who raised their hand today to have the spiritual strength to do whatever they need to do, what your Holy Spirit's telling them to do in their lives.